you've indicated that the uh, Americans uh, were implicated or implicated in the death squads. Are they also implicated in those massive car bombings that happened about a year ago and up to eight months ago or so? I, I found it mysterious that there were hardly any American casualties, and yet a lot of them were right in Baghdad, where you'd think the Americans had you know, roadblocks and things. And I heard apocryphal stories about bombs being planted at the roadblocks in cars that then drive off. Okay, a couple more. You mentioned the number of members of uh, Iraq Veterans Against the War, some hundreds. Surely with the numbers of U.S. soldiers there, there's a great deal of questioning going on. And you find other expressions of, of that taking place in the uh, military. Are there any examples of, of uh, units refusing to carry out <coughs> orders for massacres rather than for human rights violations. Yeah. Okay, I'll take those three. Uh, Democrats, why they want to look at withdrawal. Um, the, short ver the short answer is they're all funded by the same people. They're all being applied pressure from the same lobby groups, whether they be military, industrial, complex uh, lobby groups, or APAC or JIMSA. Um, they're, they're, it's just they're all the same, it's just the level of donations to different people in different parties varies somewhat. Um, and right now, because of the catastrophic situation the Republican Party is in, because of the uh, Cheney administration, uh, uh, we, all of the corporate funders in the military industrial complex, lobby groups and funders, they're all shifting their funds over to the Democrats. I mean, when Rupert Murdoch is campaigning, fundraising for Hillary Clinton, this is a pretty clear message of what's happening with the Democrats. There's no difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, so I just answered the second part of your question. Um, America's involvement in car bombings, it's really, really difficult to say, but there is uh, there are a couple of evidences of... Uh, of involvement. One, in, one involved British undercover SAS officers. This was actually a very well documented, reported on story. Uh, it was a good ways back. It was uh, at least a year and a half ago down in Basra. Two undercover British SA, SAS Special Forces guys were caught uh, wearing dishdashes, wigs, uh, mustaches, and uh, driving in an unmarked car. They were pulled over by Iraqi security forces. The car had explosives remote detonating devices and a lot of weapons and communication equipment. And they were thrown in jail and they were going to be tried for planting bombs at mosques to foment sectarian violence. And before they could be tried, the British military with tanks and helicopters raised the jail to the ground and got their two guys out. And actually, uh, it was March 2006 in Tikrit, there were uh, security contractors, they, they, it wasn't reported what company they were with, Western security contractors, again pulled over by Iraqi security forces into Crete in a very, very similar incident. Um, and then the last, U.S. troop resistance. Um, I was on book tour in the end of October. I went up to Fort Drum in upstate New York. Uh, Rock Veterans Against the War has a strong chapter there because most of them are actually active duty troops and they have a GI resistance cafe, it's called the Different Drummer Cafe. And uh, I was talking to a couple of the guys there uh, that when I, while I was up there, because I, I gave a talk at the Different Drummer Cafe, and uh, uh, that, one of them was an active duty troop soldier who had just come back from Iraq after spending a year there. And he was in the outskirts of Fallujah and Abu Ghraib City area, and he said, you know, we were getting attacked so often when we were running our patrols uh, literally going out every other day and getting a roadside bomb. And we knew also, none of us believed in the mission, and plus what, what aided that, uh, our low morale, was that our commander, we knew our commander was sending us out to get in combat because he got a medal even if he wasn't with us. And so enough's enough, so we would go out on patrols, we'd find a big empty field, we'd go park our unarmed Humvees under ideally some bait palms, and we'd listen to music and we'd drink cigarettes, and we uh, we drink so uh, I'm sorry we listen to music we smoke cigarettes and we drink soda and we pretend and we call in every hour as was our policy to base and say yeah we're still searching the field for weapons caches and then we go back home after 12 hours and he said we were doing this every other day and then I talked to another guy also active duty in Iraq at a different year of the occupation in a different location same exact story. 
and it was rampant. I talked to more and more of these guys, and it was rampant. And I thought, oh wow, I, I, uh, this, I'm on this stuff. And they called these, you know, they used to call them search and destroy missions. They call them search and avoid missions uh, in Iraq. And I was all kind of full of myself and thinking, oh, this is a great story. And I wrote it up for Interpress Service and posted it. And then a little further down the road, I went to another presentation, and there was a bunch of Iraq veterans against the war guys there, and they were selling these CDs. And I started talking to one of them about what I uh, had just told you guys about. And he's like, he's like, oh, and at the time I didn't know they were called search and avoid missions. And, and I said, yeah, so these guys were really doing this. He's like, oh yeah, all of us were doing this. He's like, look at this CD, we've got a song on here called Search and Avoid. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's happening. 